Uh, it's a great honor to be asked to speak here. Uh, so you've all heard of the God particle. I'm going to talk about a particle at the other end of the spectrum, perhaps the lightest fundamental particle there is, but one that could shed light on how we come to be here. So the neutrino is a fundamental particle so tiny that it was originally thought to be massless. They come in three flavors, and those flavors are defined by the charged leptons with which they interact, the electron, the muon, and the tau. And they interact incredibly weakly, so much so that they're actually very hard to detect. To illustrate that, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory detected neutrinos produced in the sun, and one of the things they sought to see was a difference between the flux during the daytime, when the neutrinos have just traveled through the vacuum, and during the night, when the neutrinos have also had to cross the entire span of the Earth. And astonishingly, they saw no difference. So you can put the entire Earth in the way of a neutrino and it will just pass straight through. Another uh, property of these particles that makes them very intriguing to study was first seen by two state-of-the-art experiments, pun intended. Um, one of these was Super Kamio Kande, which detected atmospheric neutrinos produced from the decay of muons in the atmosphere. That decay produces both muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos in a ratio that we can predict. However, uh, Super K detected these neutrinos coming from all directions, both from above, from the sides, and from below. And what they saw was that when looking at the muon neutrinos from below, there seemed to be a deficit. So that's the neutrinos that have had to travel the longest baseline. They seemed to be disappearing. The second experiment is the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, or SNOW. Uh, SNOW, as I mentioned, detected neutrinos from the sun. These neutrinos are produced in the electron state. Now, a number of experiments prior to SNOW had looked for solar neutrinos and seen a significantly reduced flux compared to what we expected from solar models. What made SNOW unique was the use of heavy water as a target, which allowed a measurement of the pure electron neutrino flux, which was suppressed in agreement with previous experiments, and the total flux of neutrinos independently of flavor. And that flux was in agreement with solar model predictions, which confirmed our understanding of the sun, and told us that in fact, the neutrinos produced in the sun in the electron state were changing flavor before we detected them on the Earth. Of course, we now know that this is due to neutrino oscillation, uh, which is the idea that although neutrinos are produced and detected in their weak or flavor eigenstates, they actually propagate in their physical or mass states. And physicists being as creative as we are, those are just called one, two, and three. So this idea is entirely analogous to classical coupled oscillators. Uh, so if you picture two pendula on a string, if you set one of them swinging, as you watch over time, the other one will pick up the motion. And the idea here is because energy can be transferred through the coupling uh, by the string. So this is just like um, a neutrino starting in the electron state, oscillating to the muon state, and back again. However, if you took these two pendula and you set them moving in what's called a normal mode, in this case, if you offset them by the same amount and set them swinging, they'll stay in that state. And that's analogous to the neutrino mass states. So in the simplified two-flavor picture, you can view this as basically a rotation of your basis. So the electron neutrino is a large part nu1, but it has a small component of nu2. And if you view that graphically, uh, you can picture the nu1 and nu2 states as your pure states. And then the electron and muon neutrino are a composite of those. And so if you create a neutrino in the electron state, it's some fraction nu1 and some fraction nu2. Those then propagate at different speeds. And if you detect it sometime later, it's a different combination, giving you some probability that you detect it as a different flavor. We can actually evaluate that probability. It's shown here. And you can see it depends on the energy of the neutrino, on the baseline, the length that that neutrino has propagated. So that explains the results seen by super K. And it also depends on this term delta m squared. This is the difference of the squared neutrino masses. So it's this term that tells us neutrinos have to have mass in order for neutrino oscillation to occur. So the observation of neutrino oscillation is what told us at least one of the neutrino states must have a non-zero mass. 
And this is really a, a fascinating process because this is entirely a quantum mechanical effect and we're observing it on macroscopic scales, on distances of hundreds of kilometers. So there were then a number of uh, terrestrial experiments which really confirmed that the observed flavor change was due to neutrino oscillation. Uh, one of these was the Camland reactor experiment, which looked for electron antineutrinos produced as a byproduct of nuclear fission in reactors. Uh, this experiment was actually led by uh, Stuart Friedman in the US, uh, who passed away a few years ago. It's a great shame he can't be here to celebrate with us today. Camland had a, a beautiful result, which you can see here. They actually saw the L over E dependence of the neutrino uh, flavor change, which is, was really the definitive sign that this is due to oscillation. More recently, uh, the Dia Bay experiment has also looked for uh, reactor neutrino disappearance, but on a much shorter baseline, which makes them sensitive to a different set of oscillation parameters. And then there's the long baseline experiments, K2K, T2K, uh, MINOS also, which look for neutrinos produced in accelerators. You can produce a very high energy beam of neutrinos. And these experiments saw muon neutrino disappearance. And T2K has actually now seen the first sign of electron neutrino appearance. So we now have a very complete picture of neutrino oscillation. And you might ask, why are we still studying them? What more is there to learn? Well, the weak nature of their interactions actually allows us to use neutrinos to probe places we otherwise couldn't see. From the center of the Earth, to the core of the Sun, to far distant supernovae. They're also a fascinating particle in their own right. Uh, we know that the Nu2 state, the second mass state, is heavier than Nu1. That comes from solar neutrino measurements. But we actually don't know whether the Nu3 state is the heaviest or the lightest of the three. So that gives us two options for the ordering of the neutrino mass states, or the mass hierarchy. We also don't know the absolute neutrino mass scale. We don't know how far offset from zero these masses are. But perhaps the most interesting property of the neutrinos is that they have the potential to be their own antiparticle. And neutrinos are actually unique among the, the known fundamental fermions in having this property. And if this is true, they're what is called Majorana particles. And it's this um, potential property of neutrinos that, at least for me, is somewhat reminiscent of some of M.C. Escher's work, particularly the tessellations, where the, the negative space is basically creating the same pattern moving in the opposite direction. So this property of neutrinos could actually go so far as to explain the origin of our matter-dominated universe. That's a fairly grandiose statement, so that needs some explanation. Uh, so let's talk a little about matter and antimatter. To a large extent, the interactions that we know about conserve the difference between matter and antimatter. And what I mean by that is they're created and destroyed in equal amounts. So we would expect the same thing to be true of the Big Bang. And the universe should contain equal amounts matter and antimatter. In order for there to be any asymmetry, we need to observe something called CP violation. CP violation is basically a measure of the difference in the behavior of matter and antimatter. So if neutrinos exhibit CP violation, then the probability that a muon neutrino can oscillate to an electron neutrino would be different from that same probability for the antiparticles. Now, if we look at the universe, we do see that it is out of balance. It is clearly a matter-dominated universe with very small pockets of antimatter. And that is actually very fortunate for us, because we know what happens when matter and antimatter uh, come together. They annihilate. So if the universe was made up of equal amounts of the two, we would not be standing here discussing this today. So we need to explain this asymmetry. And to do it, we need a large amount of CP violation. Some degree of CP violation has been observed in the quark sector, but it's not su sufficient to explain the degree of asymmetry. So how does this connect? Well, if neutrinos are Majorana in nature, then they can undergo something called the seesaw mechanism, which in effect splits the neutrino into two particles. There's the very light neutrino, with which we're familiar, that we've detected and even created on the Earth. And then there's a much heavier sister particle, so heavy that we have not yet detected it, but it could have been created in the Big Bang. And if this particle exhibits CP violation in its decays, then that could explain the current matter-antimatter asymmetry. So in order to explain that asymmetry, we need two things. 
Majorana neutrinos, and CP violation. So how might one look for Majorana neutrinos? Well, for a very small uh, number of isotopes in nature for which beta decay is energetically forbidden, they can decay by a process called double beta decay, where essentially two neutrons undergo beta decay simultaneously, and you get a pair of electrons and a pair of neutrinos. But if neutrinos are their own antiparticle, they can effectively annihilate inside the nucleus, and the only thing that escapes is the electron pair. Now, the predicted half-life for this process, or the current experimental constraints, I should say, um, are incredibly long, 10 to the 25 years. For scale, the life of the universe is 10 to the 10. Um, fortunately, Avogadro's number is very large. So if you have about 100 moles of one of these isotopes, you do actually have some chance of seeing this process. And if we observe it, if we see this neutrinoless double beta decay process, that shows that lepton number can be violated. It tells us that neutrinos must be Majorana in nature. And as a bonus, it actually gives us a measure of the neutrino mass because the rate of the process depends on that mass. So this is really a very uh, exciting field, and there's been an explosion of technology in the experiments looking for this process. And the reason is actually similar to what we were just hearing about dark matter, is because this is a very rare process, and you expect a tiny number of events in your detector. So you need to be, uh, you need a very clean detector, you need to reduce radioactive backgrounds, you need to be very deep underground to reduce cosmogenics, you need good energy resolution, you need a very large target mass, because it's such a rare process. And basically, all of these different technologies have different uh, pros and cons. They each have several advantages um, in the required features. So it ranges from ultra-pure germanium detectors to uh, bolometric experiments, uh, time projection chambers, and even very large-scale liquid scintillator detectors. Now, if we look at the sensitivity of these experiments, we tend to show it on this figure. It's called the lobster plot. You can sort of see the lobster claws coming out. Um, this is the lightest neutrino mass, and this is the effective Majorana neutrino mass. If we look at current limits, uh, they're sitting at around the sort of 150 to 400 milli electron volt scale. And if we look at what we might achieve in the next five years, there's a number of experiments coming online, and they will significantly improve the sensitivity. So we'll be able to push down to masses as low as about 50 milli electron volts. So there's a good chance there may be a discovery in the next five years. And then, of course, if there isn't, the question is how one improves sensitivity beyond that. So that's the search for Majorana neutrinos, but then we also need CP violation. Uh, this is a much longer timescale project. It's more like a sort of 15 to 20 year scale. But I want to mention it just to complete the picture. Uh, this is an experiment called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or DUNE. Uh, and the idea here is to create a high energy beam of neutrinos at Fermilab in Illinois and send them 800 miles through the Earth to a deep underground detector in the Sanford Research Facility in South Dakota. And this beam will be able to produce both neutrinos and antineutrinos, allowing a very high precision search for any difference in the behavior of the two. So in my last couple of minutes, I just want to discuss some new technology that may potentially herald the breakthroughs of the future. And this is a new target medium that has been developed called water-based liquid scintillator, which could allow high precision neutrino detection on a new scale. So what is water-based liquid scintillator? It's a very simple idea. You take oil and water, and you mix them. Despite popular belief, it turns out that is possible. Um, and the result is actually a target medium that gives you the benefits of both worlds, uh, the benefits of a pure water detector and a large liquid scintillator detector. So you can build a very large detector because you have the low attenuation of water. It doesn't absorb very much light. You have directional information from the Cherenkov component in water, but you also have high light yield of scintillator, which allows you to go to very low energy thresholds. And the experiment that's uh, being proposed is called THEA. It would be a 50 to 100 kiloton scale detector. This, this pale blue is an image of the detector, just to give you an idea of the size, uh, roughly the size of the Statue of Liberty. And because of the uh, high precision nature of this detector, you could achieve a very broad physics program. Uh, ranging from neutrinoless double beta decay, 
through solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, and even long baseline physics, neutrino mass hierarchy and CP violation. So this is physics that spans five orders of magnitude and energy in a single detector. And I'm going to leave you with uh, a bit of a brain teaser. In the same detector, you could show that neutrinos and antineutrinos are the same by observing neutrinoless double beta decay, and that neutrinos and antineutrinos behave differently by observing CP violation. So to conclude, um, neutrinos have led us on a very exciting chase. Um, the recent decades have seen some major breakthroughs, but this is by no means the end of the road. These really just opened the door to new and even bigger discoveries, and the next five years have the potential to change the way we think about neutrino physics, and even perhaps turn our understanding of the universe on its head. Thank you. Thank you.